we'll go to the uh, first slide, see what's going on for the next month or so. Do you want this quote or do you want to read it or do you want to just let it sit there? I think it's insulting to everybody. I'm sure the universe oh. is full of intelligent life. It's just been too intelligent to come here. We won't talk any politics. Let's just go to the next slide. All right, there you go. <laughs> this is funny. I laughed out loud when I saw this. Glenn, are you still here? Yeah, I'm just letting you, uh, oh, giving letting Sal Arisha time to read it. He's a little <laughs> slower reader than the rest of us. Okay, Sal, so Sal's all set. We'll go to the next slide. All right. all right, I thought that was pretty funny. All right, here you go. Okay, here's what's going so on this month. <laughs> we okay? We're good. I don't know if that's the Russians trying to hack in on us or not. It could be, it could be. Okay, Neptune's in opposition on the 11th. So it's 2.7 billion miles away, but I like to think of it at, at uh, light distance. If you look at Neptune, uh, you're looking at light that left four hours earlier. That's how long it takes to get to us from Neptune. It, it's currently a degree and a half east and kind of north of the fourth magnitude star Phi Aqua Aquaria. It's just below the uh, circlet of Pisces. On the 14th, Venus and the waning crescent moon pair up in the evening or the pre-dawn sky. And Rich, I was going to let you take that. You talked about this and an opportunity to see Venus by daylight. You have your own method, but just for simple, if, if any time Venus is uh, near the moon, uh, just look for the moon and then use binoculars to find Venus during the daytime. Uh, and then you can find it with a telescope as well. On September 22nd, autumnal equinox, and we do go to the period now for the next six months where the uh, nights are longer than the days, good for observing. On the 24th and the 25th, Jupiter and Saturn are close together in the sky. And of course the moon will be passing them. It'll be near Jupiter on the 24th and near Saturn on the 25th. And I've always tried to mention, especially the neophytes, that's a good way to locate a planet is when the moon is right next to it. So that's a good opportunity for people that it have a hard time locating things uh, to find those two planets, although it's pretty hard to miss Jupiter in the evening sky right now. It's bright enough. On Saturday, September 26th, International Observe the Moon Night, and um, we're going to celebrate it with a surprise party. Uh, it's a surprise party because it's at Mario's, and you had no idea we're going to do this at all, so that's a Oops, surprise. Sorry. We'll go yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, and then on that weekend, thank goodness. <laughs> on Friday and Saturday, October 2nd and 3rd, Venus and Regulus will be less than one degree apart. Look east before sunrise. Uh, Mars is coming up to a pretty good opposition. On October 6th, it'll be the closest to Earth. And I know I talked to Rich recently. Rich has already been scouting out Mars. And I know Mario took a very nice picture of Mars recently. Uh, if you haven't been looking at Mars, it, I, I was out maybe about a week ago early in the morning and I had not been looking at Mars and I got up probably maybe an hour before sunrise, stepped outside and the first thing I see is this brilliant star in the southern sky. My first quick second reaction has got to be the space, uh, International Space Station. No, it's not moving. And then I thought, this is again within a second of seeing this thing. Could it be a supernova? No, it's kind of reddish. Then it dawned on me it's Mars. And it's been a long time since I've Mar seen Mars that bright. Uh, the other night I was up, by the way, you don't have to wait till the middle of the night to see it. But I was out at about 11 o'clock and Mars was already a pretty good uh, height above the eastern horizon. So you don't have to wait till the middle of the night to see it. It's, it's up there 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. Yeah, Glenn, it's rising, it's rising at about 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, in the evening. Right. Um, and um, you got to give it a couple hours to get up there high enough. Yeah, yeah it's up there. And this is, uh, this is going to be the last good opposition until 2033. It's already about 20 arc seconds across in apparent size. And that's a good opposition of Mars. It's uh, about magnitude minus 2.2, somewhere around there. And it'll be brighter than that right through the end of October. And that's important again, this 2033. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of us old timers may not be around in 2033. In fact, unless we get some, uh, a new crop of young members, the only people that'll be in the club at that time will be Kira and Corey. Kira will be the president and Corey's gonna be the, um, the vice president, secretary, treasurer, membership treasurer, and he'll also be the whole entire membership. So we gotta get recruit some new or younger members so there'll be people around to see that particular opposition. So this is the last chance for a lot of us and start to check it out.
Well, and on man. Wednesday, October 7th, I threw this one in. The, the Draconid Meteor Shower is very minor. There's only a handful at a time. But this one's interesting because it reaches its peak. You don't have to wait till midnight. <laughs> it's, uh, it's up there pretty much right as soon as it gets dark enough. And it's near the, uh, the head of Draco the Dragon, that four-star asterism. So I'd say just go outside. If you're going to be out observing anyway, uh, go outside, and once it gets dark enough, check that area out. Look for a half hour. You might see a handful of meteors at that particular time. The moon, again, is favorable. So this is a good opportunity to check out that particular shower. And now Glenn, we'll go to the... Uh, go ahead. Glenn, can I just interject something? I, I, um, I know the Draconid shower back in 1946. I wasn't born yet, but I've heard from people that actually saw it. It was pre stormed pretty nicely. So the Draconids, it may not be the shower. It's not a Perseids. It's not a Geminids. And I haven't read anything about it peaking or, shot or storming this year, but it has been known to undergo outbursts. So that it may be something you want to get out there and look at. Yeah, I forget what comet it's associated with, but as I recall, a couple of years ago, that particular comet made a near pass to Earth. And there was a huge outburst visible from Europe. We didn't get to see it here. So, uh, but any meteor shower, that's the thing. You know, you might as well go out and just check it out because it could be one of those weird situations where you have a meteor storm that only the people who went out to see that shower get to see. So it's always worth stepping outside, especially where this one is right after sunset. So no reason why not unless uh, we have problems with the moon. But again, the moon isn't supposed to rise until later in the evening. And now we'll go to the uh, uh, observer's challenge. Now you want it because I, I clicked onto it like three times already by mistake. Now you can go. Yes, you have um, my permission. The, the parent comet of the Draconids is Jacobini Center. Okay, thank you. There we go. All right, the observer's challenge this month is uh, the Veil Nebula in Cygnus. And the, on the left-hand side, there, there's a finder chart for it. And naked eye, you just start with epsilon, part of the cross, and then a little bit below it, there is 52 Cygni, which is a fourth magnitude star. It's actually a K-type uh, supergiant. And on the uh, right-hand side, there's Doug Paul's picture of the whole, it's a wide field view of the whole thing. And in that particular picture, it's oriented the same way the finder chart is. Over on the left-hand side is the eastern part of the veil. That's NGC 6992 slash 6995. And on the far right side, you can see that star right there. Um, that's 52 Cygni, and that's the West Nebula, which is 6990. Now, Rich, you can probably point. You see where Pickering's Triangle is? A little bit above it. You go right above. Right here? And yeah, right in that area. That's Pickering's Triangle. No, it's actually that, that nebulosity. There it is. You had it just oh, this right here. That's Pickering. It's like a, it looks like a slice of pizza. That's Pickering's Triangle. And then if you go back to the top of the triangle and move a little bit to the left, here. Yeah, and that's the, those two nebulosities, that's NGC 69, 74, and 79. So before we get into everything else, as far as the challenges go, um, the first thing is, can you see it with binoculars? And you might need an O3 filter. Of course, most of us don't have two of them. I understand that it's possible to see that with the naked eye with an O3 filter. I don't know, the whole system is about seventh magnitude, but that would be the ultimate challenge. So if there are any Steve O'Meara's out there, give it a try. The next thing though is binoculars. As far as small telescopes, and I'll show a sketch a little later, and I've seen both parts with a, a small scope, so it's not hard to see them at all with, the, with that type of instrument. We'd like to see if anybody can make a visual observation of Pickering, Pickering's Triangle of those two uh, small NGC patches near the north there. Now we'll go to the next slide. And we have Mario's close-up images. The one on the left is the Eastern Nebula. And the one on the right, of course, is the Western Nebula uh, with 52 Cygni right in the middle. Now, to me, when I was out observing, uh, and what you probably want to do is go to the uh, uh, the Western Nebula first, go to 52 Cygni because it's easy to see with your finder scope. It's a little hard to see that nebula because the star tends to blind out a lot of things. I did see it with a four and a half inch scope very faintly. And of course, an O3 filter helped a lot. And also I used a, an Orion, a narrow band filter and that seemed to do work really well. The other side, what I did is with the 52 Cygni in the field of view, just kind of move your scope um, toward the east and a little bit north, and the southern nebula just pop right into view. It's a lot brighter, especially the upper part of it, the northern part. And we'll go to the next slide, and these are sketches that I made. Now, the first one is right out of my notebook. This is way back in 1981. I was still pretty much a rookie observer. I'd been, a, I'd been using a telescope for a little more than a year at that time, and that's a sketch of uh, um, 
the, uh, the eastern nebula, the eastern part of the veil with a little three inch Edmund scope, no filter at all. But and back in, that was from Stellafane, which explains why I didn't need the filter. By the way, the red numbers up there, I, I started doing variable observing back at that time, variable star observing. And those are part of the Julian dates for those particular stars. And on that particular evening, as a Cygni, I, I think it had already had an outburst. It was about 9.8 magnitude. And there was a Nova in Vulpecula as well. So even up at Stellafane, I'll try to do some variable stars. But that's the veil again with a little three inch Edmund telescope, that uh, three inch F10 that they sold back in the 60s. And on the other side, I was talking about this earlier tonight. Um, Bruce Berger had been asking about some type of a form for observing logs for sketchers. And as I had said, I've gone online. You can Google uh, observing log sheets, astronomy observing log sheets, and there's tons of them out there. I just never found one that really appealed to me. So I made this one up with the, the AtMob logo, and I'd be glad to send this out to the membership. It's in, uh, it's in Word. It's in a Word file, so you can change it yourself and uh, adapt it. But anyway, this is a sketch of the... Uh, of the Western Veil with 61, 52 Cygni rather in it. And that was with a four and a half, or excuse me, a 10 inch reflector at, uh, what did I use for power? 48 power, field of view about a degree. This is a big object. So you're gonna need some uh, low power to catch this thing at all. It, can it just that the newsletter print this on one of the pages? One of the, one of the logs? I could send it to Al to put in the newsletter. I could also send it out to the membership by email after the meeting as well. But yeah, that might be a good idea. The only thing is when we're talking about it, uh, I put down, you got name, date, all that stuff, sky conditions. And I put down seeing, and to tell you the truth, with a lot of deep sky stuff, the seeing, it it's, can be still critical if you're looking for the central star in a uh, planetary nebula and maybe some faint stars in the cluster. But for the most part, uh, I rarely use the seeing. I put it down there, but limiting magnitude, of course, is very helpful. And then you've got the name of the object, uh, sketch and notes, and then at the very bottom, the uh, the instruments used and so forth. So I'll uh, I'll send that to Al for the newsletter. You know, this might even be in the newsletter because I think Al publishes all the pictures. If he's uh, online here, he can let us know, but I think he might find it in the newsletter. Uh, it is in the newsletter, Glenn. Uh, it's also a link to both of these of course, they're just pictures, but okay. uh, we want to post these onto the uh, uh, the web, the actual AdMob website. Okay, thank you, Al. Yeah, I'll be glad to send something out to the membership as well online. And that's about it. We'll get to get you back to our uh, virtual president, Rich. Unless there are any questions. Any questions? All right. Keep looking up. Thanks, Glenn. I want to mention to everybody, especially uh, newer members, uh, that there is a program called Globe at Night, globeatnight.org. It's kind of a citizen science project, real basic to do uh, naked eye uh, estimates of your, of your sky. And since we're all kind of stuck at home uh, more than we are used to, this is a really good activity. Um, and what I'd like to share with you is a map of these are globe at night um, observations that have been made in this. The little dots represent uh, observations that people have made uh, uh, around the greater Boston area. I'm a little worried about this uh, magnitude 7 one in Billerica and this one in Westford. Uh, and, the, and the note to it says that uh, the sky was mostly covered with clouds. I could only see one star, but I have a magnitude 7 <laughs> sky. That's pretty funny. Anyway, the, the, the reason. You, you might have done this before in years past and said, well, I've done it. I don't need to do it again. No, that's not the case. You actually need to do it often because believe it or not, the current um, uh, generation of orbiting satellites that record the Earth at night are insensitive, not sensitive in blue light. And so they give a kind of false sense of what the light is on the ground. And researchers use these globe at night data, these data right here that you're looking at, uh, to as sort of ground truth for the satellite data. And so I encourage you, uh, it, it's, it's something you do during the dark of the moon, which is right now. Uh, they're using, we're using Cygnus as the target area for stars. Just go to the website, globeatnight.org to download the charts. And it's really a great activity for your neighbors and friends and family um, that, uh, that anyone can do. And it's a, it's a good uh, group, or group or family activity anyway. That's it. Tonight's speaker is 
Robert Noya, Three Roads to Extraterrestrial Life. Bob is a friend of the um, ATMOB, having been a uh, editor-in-chief of Sky and Telescope. Um, he has worked for astronomy, Discover, Mercury Magazines, and uh, has and actually enjoyed his stint working for NASA at its Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Um, hundreds of articles and books. You can visit his website at robertnoya.com. But in any event, uh, I do want to thank Richard and uh, Mario for uh, helping to set this up. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in tonight. Um, I must confess that uh, I don't miss the Boston winners. I don't miss the Boston area traffic. But I wish I could be there tonight. And uh, I do miss uh, at mob meetings and the dinners at Chang Show and visiting the clubhouse and just chit chatting with all the members. And I. Hope all of you are doing well and staying healthy during the pandemic. <clears throat> um, I'm living right now outside Hershey, Pennsylvania, Chocolate Town, USA. I'm um, still writing about astronomy, but I've been writing for local publications about a lot of different topics, kind of expanded my repertoire, which has been refreshing, writing about things like music, sports, local politics, Vietnam veterans, history. So that's been kind of uh, interesting. Um, I haven't been back up at Boston since I moved here in 2016, but I'm sure one of these days I'll get up there. So I do want to dedicate the talk tonight to Tal, um, who uh, I worked with briefly at Sky and Telescope, and who I remember very fondly too from ATMOB meetings. And uh, you know, I was very sad to hear the news earlier this year that he passed away. Um, and of course, I didn't know until uh, Rich mentioned earlier about Anna Hillier and Terry Manning as well. So I dedicate this talk to them as well. Um, so my talk tonight is gonna be based on a cover story I wrote for the current issue of Astronomy Magazine. I believe this is the issue that's on newsstands right now. Um, and it's, uh, you know, if you find this talk interesting, you know, you can check out the issue. Of course, it has an article by ATMOB member Glenn Chappell in there as well. Um, and there's also a accompanying web article that I wrote as well that sort of complements the magazine version. And I do want to thank my editors at Astronomy, uh, Rich Talcott, who has since retired, and Allison Kleesman for inviting me to write the article and also for the excellent work they did preparing it for publication. Um, so my talk tonight, um, you know, is a topic that's been of interest for scientists for a very, very long time, centuries, and that's the search for life on other worlds. And of course, that raises questions about the prevalence and nature of extraterrestrial life. Uh, so scientists have discussed these issues for centuries, but we still really don't have answers to these very interesting and profound questions. And given the popularity of movies uh, relating to, you know, science fiction depiction of alien creatures, this is obviously a uh, topic that's of interest to the public as well. But, you know, despite all of this interest and speculation about extraterrestrial life, for me at least, it's kind of like string theory. It's a science whose subject matter has not been proven to exist. So what I'd like to see happen, at least in my lifetime, is for astrobiology to be turned from kind of a theoretical science, although obviously there's experiments done in laboratories, but I wanna see it really turned into an observational science and let's find out you know, what's out there. Um, so I just wanna briefly state, there's reasons that scientists have to be optimistic that there's a lot of life out there. Uh, we know, for example, from rocks in Greenland and Australia, that life got started very early in Earth's history. You know, probably is at least 3.8 billion years ago, possibly even further back than there. Uh, so the fact that life got started early at least gives. Uh, okay, the fact that life got started early, um, you know, gives us some reason for optimism that if conditions are right, where you've got liquid water, car organic molecules, flows of energy, life is you know, very likely to get going. Um, another reason for optimism is just our galaxy. There is just you know, hundreds of billions of stars out there. We know from planet surveys of 
of planets around other stars that um, there's an average of at least one planet per star, uh, perhaps more. So that's, you know, we're talking hundreds of billions of planets in our Milky Way galaxy, you know, perhaps as many as a trillion. And then if you include moons, you know, the number of possible worlds that could host life is just literally astronomical. And then I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, you know, looked many times at the Orion Nebula, um, you know, interstellar, that's where stars form, stars and planets form in these interstellar clouds. And the good news is, is that these clouds are brimming with elements such as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, which are essential to life on Earth. So our, our galaxy appears to be very richly endowed with the chemical ingredients for life. But, you know, I would argue that it's always dangerous to draw strong conclusions from just a single example of a phenomenon. I mean, I don't think this is likely, but we don't know. I mean, maybe the origin of life on Earth was a once in a universe fluke that's never been repeated. Um, you know, maybe it's been really lucky that Earth has undergone profound changes uh, in its atmosphere and surface conditions through its four and a half billion year history, and yet life has managed to survive that whole time. Uh, well, we don't know if that's common or a fluke. Uh, we had life go for most of Earth's history, very primitive, single cell life, then it, eventually we developed multicellular life. And then it, with uh, Cambrian explosion, complex plants and animals, you know, we don't know if that was common or a fluke. So we really can't answer these deep questions about life in the universe by just studying life on Earth. We need to find out, you know, if Earth is typical or atypical. So basically, you know, my, as my art, astronomy article explains, there's basically three different ways we, that I can think of at least that we could find extraterrestrial life. One is exploring the solar system. A uh, number two is probing the atmospheres of exoplanets, planets around other stars. And then the third road, which I'll talk about at the end, is the search for a SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or techno signatures of advanced uh, civilizations. Now, this is not a race. It's not like these scientists are competing with each other. Uh, so, and I don't know which method is going to, you know, come up with the first detection of extraterrestrial life. We don't know how easy or hard it's going to be. So there's, there's a lot that we don't know. But, you know, the, our instrumentation and technology and the telescopes keep getting better and better and better. So I'm hopeful that, you know, I'm 57 I'm hope, hoping this will happen in, you know, next 10 or 20 years, hopefully in my lifetime, that we'll have the first detection. Um, you know, so another big question is, what is it that we're looking for? Right before I turned into this webinar, I read a, an article on eon.com about the origin of life. And, you know, even scientists do not have any real idea how life originated. They don't have an agreed upon definition of life. Um, so it's not like totally clear cut, even what it exactly is that we're looking for. Um, you know, on Earth, we see incredible variety of life here. You know, we have life in acidic hot springs. We have life in cold, dry Antarctic valleys. We have life, you know, in the crushing pr ocean pr pressures of the deep ocean depths. And then, of course, when we go to more complex life, which we have on the slide here, you know, life just takes on this amazing variety of forms that can fill, you know, huge numbers of different environmental niches. Um, you know, and so then, you know, you know, we're talking about Earth here, even though we have a wide variety of environments on Earth, we really don't know what are the full conditions, physical and chemical, that are necessary to support life um, on other worlds. I think it's very clear that we're, you know, there could be life on planets that are, have environments totally unlike anything we have here on Earth. So I think scientists, and I think a lot of them actually do, they need to adopt out-of-the-box thinking uh, when they're thinking about extraterrestrial life. Um, now, there's a book I recently read called Imagine Life by a 
planetary scientists Michael Summers and physicist James Treffel, in which they really define three kinds of life. The first possibility is life as we know it. That's life, you know, that uses carbon. The element carbon is a building block for life. It uses liquid water as a solvent, and it uses DNA or RNA uh, as a molecule to encode and transmit ge uh, genetic information. So my talk tonight is primarily about this kind of life, life that would have at least some kind of similarities to life on Earth. Uh, the second kind that, they, that uh, Summers and Treffel define is life as we don't know it. Uh, for example, this is a scene from the original Star Trek series uh, where the crew, Captain Kirk here is pointing his phaser at a horda, which I think this was actually a very imaginative science fiction. The horda is a creature based on the element silicon rather than carbon. So life as we don't know it would maybe share some characteristics with earth life, but might you know, use a different solvent other than water or be based on silicon or some other element instead of carbon. And then uh, they bring up a third possibility, and this is really fun to speculate on, and that is life as we really don't know it. So consider the book, The Black Cloud, of, of classic sci-fi novel by British phys physicist Fred Hoyle that he published in 1957. In this book, he imagined this interstellar cloud that was sentient. It moved into the solar system and actually started to blot out the sun. We're able to establish communication with it. And the cloud is kind of stunned that there's intelligent life on a planet. So I, I kind of like that idea that, you know, who knows what, what's really out there. You know, on the right, there could be artificial intelligence out there, life based on machines and algorithms, you know, rather than biochemistry. So I think given, you know, our ignorance of all the possible life forms that could be out there, you know, we can't really resolve these burning questions we have about extraterrestrial life through you know, speculation or calculations. We don't really know who or what is out there, so we need to observe and explore, and that's what I'll be discussing over the next uh, half hour. So I'm gonna start off with the solar system, and uh, Mario sent this image to me a couple days ago, and I thought I would use that image. Hopefully that'll prevent him uh, not to heckle me at the end of the talk, as he promised that he would do. Of course, Mars periodically comes close to Earth as it is right now, so it's relatively easy to observe and to reach with spacecraft. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna start off with Mars. Uh, now, I think as all of you know, for very long stretches of Earth's history, a lot of people, including learned astronomers, just assumed that there could be intelligent life or vegetation or other kinds of life on Mars. Uh, but, you know, NASA started spending, sending spacecraft to Mars in the late 60s, and then we have, you know, the Vikings in the 70s, and the orbiter pictures, you know, didn't reveal any obvious signs of life. It looked pretty much like a barren, uninhabited planet. It kind of disabused humanity of these notions dating back, you know, to Percival Lowell and even earlier. But these orbiters did show these valley networks that we can see in these two pictures that look very much like dried river valleys on Earth. And since then, since the Vikings of the 70s, future NASA missions and landers and rovers have really pretty definitively established that yes, these were carved by flowing water very long ago, three, three and a half billion years ago. Um, so, you know, where there was water on Mars, that leads to interesting questions, you know, did life ever get its start on Mars? Now, NASA did attempt to answer that question in 1976. It sent two Viking landers down to the surface, Viking 1 and 2. They became the first successful Mars landers uh, after several failed Soviet attempts. Um, and here we see a model on the left and an image on the right from Viking 1, that big boulder that you see is named Big Joe. That's my favorite rock on Mars. Now, the both Viking landers were equipped with these mechanical arms that could you know, scoop in soil samples 
they each lander had three experiments to search for life on Mars, basically exposing these samples to nutrients, seeing if they, there would be some kind of metabolic activity that would then release gases. And one of the three experiments actually turned up positive results at both sites. This was the famed labeled release experiment. Um, you know, and to this day, it's kind of a, you know, it's the results kind of sitting there. The other two experiments were basically negative. The, the organic chemistry experiment didn't find any organic molecules. So the conclusion was no, um, you know, no organics, no life. The labeled release result was attributed to active soil chemistry. But to this day, you know, the scientists who were involved in that project, you know, say they, they still think they found life on Mars. I asked Chris McKay, a very, you know, res, re, re, reputable astrobiologist at NASA Ames. And, you know, he says, you know, it's probably active soil chemistry, but, you know, he said it's possible that we discovered life on Mars back in 1976. And I'm kind of disappointed. I know I've discussed this with Kelly Beattie at Sky and Telescope, and I think he shares this opinion that we're both, you know, kind of disappointed that NASA has never sent a life detection experiment uh, to Mars since Viking. Now, I'm sure many of you remember the big uh, hubbub over the Martian meteorite ALH84001. Uh, this was one in 1996. It made global headlines. There was even a press conference with President Bill Clinton. Basically, what happened is there was a team of NASA and Stanford scientists that found certain chemicals inside this rock that were indicative of, bio, of you know, biogenic, biological material. With this um, sophisticated microscope, they took this image we see on the right of these little tube-shaped structures that they said might be nanobacteria. Now this, you know, this would be life that went back billions of years ago, over three billion years ago. Um, you know, it's still controversial. The problem is that everything that was touted as evidence for life, you can explain through non-biological processes. So from my point of view, this is tantalizing, but you know, it's certainly not definitive proof that Mars once had life. But there's something going on that I think is even more intriguing, and that is both from ground-based telescope observations, but also from NASA's Curiosity rover, have measured very trace amounts of methane that rise and fall with the seasons, you know, rising in the spring, peaking in the summer and late summer, and then falling in the autumn and winter. Um, you know, there's an, an European orbiter, however, that hasn't found methane, so it's a little bit controversial. Uh, you know, on Earth, 95% of methane in Earth's atmosphere is biogenic. So you find methane, it kind of is, you know, intriguing, but once again, you know, we don't really know where this methane is coming from. It could be some kind of chemical or, you know, geological process that's producing the methane. And just last year, and you know, when this came out, I was like, wow, this is really cool. Uh, Curiosity has detected oxygen in the atmosphere, oxygen too, that's, you know, an oxygen with two uh, oxygen atoms. And the oxygen pretty much goes up and down in tandem with the methane. So, you know, most of the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere is biogenic. So, you know, these things are tantalizing results, uh, but we don't know if this is, you know, chemical or biological. We just don't know. Um, so less than two months ago on, I think it was July 30th, uh, NASA launched its next rover to Mars, Perseverance. Uh, when I interviewed NASA uh, chief scientist Jim Green, he just keeps calling it Percy for short. So I'll call it Percy. Uh, so Percy is going to land in Jezero Crater. Uh, let's hope it lands and not crashes in Je Jezero Crater on February 18th of next year. It's going to touch down. You can see this nice color-coded false color image of a really nice river delta. So it should find plenty of rocks that formed in liquid water. 
Now, you know, even some of the scientists who are on the team told me it doesn't really carry any instruments that could detect microscopic life. Uh, but what it will do is it'll collect soil, rock and soil samples, or I guess I should say regolith samples for later return to Earth. Uh, so NASA and the European Space Agency are planning to return samples from Mars in the early 2030s. Uh, now in the words of Percy Science team member Jim Bell, he said to me flat out, like he will not regard the rover's mission as complete until its samples are brought back to Earth. So NASA's planning to provide uh, another rover that'll go to Mars, land, collect, fetch the samples, and then launch them into Mars orbit. And the Europeans will provide a spacecraft that'll collect that, you know, collect that, those samples, and then return them to Earth. So I think it's neat, you know, needless to say, this is an incredibly challenging mission technologically. Uh, but if it works, you know, in the next decade, we could have Martian samples to study in our best laboratories on Earth and collected from a known location. So maybe this will resolve, you know, if they find microbes in the soil, living or dead, that would resolve, uh, or certain chemical signatures, that could resolve the, the issue once and for all. Now, it's possible the Europeans will beat NASA to the punch. Uh, they're sending, a, originally it was gonna launch this year, but they ran into problems testing the parachute, so it's been delayed a year. And this rover is called Rosalind Franklin, and it's named after the great British scientist whose work with X-ray crystallography in the early 50s paved the way for Watson and Crick's discovery of the double helix structure for the DNA molecule. Uh, so this is gonna launch uh, sometime next year, August through October. I haven't seen a definite late uh, date yet. It's gonna land in an ancient Martian lake bread bed. It's gonna carry a suite of cameras, spectrometers, and a drill. Uh, it's gonna, it can dig down up to two meters. That's about six and a half feet. Uh, it's gonna bring up samples. It's gonna crush them and do fairly sophisticated um, you know, analysis for chemistry and organic compounds, you know, looking for possible biosignatures of past, past or current life. So if there is, you know, if there is life, this rover might give us that answer and, you know, just a few years from now. Um, now, if these unmanned missions can't resolve the life question, it might require future human explorers. By the way, I really like this artwork because it shows children on Mars. You know, it might require humans to dig down, you know, maybe into aquifers deep down or other locations that are thought to be most likely to harbor life. Uh, so it might require sustained human exploration over decades to really resolve the question whether Mars is a living or dead planet. However, if we do find evidence of life on Mars, I mean, it would be an incredible, I don't think we're gonna find a plant like we see in this picture here, but I like this piece of art anyway. Uh, it would be an incredible discovery. It, you know, it, I mean, for example, this is something Chris McKay told me once, if you can find an evolutionary linkage to terrestrial life, that would imply that life either originated on one planet or the other, and was transported to the other planet inside a meteorite. Imagine that, if that's the case, we're it could have started on Mars and we're descendants of life on Mars. Or it could have been, you know, this panspermia idea that it came from to both planets from an outside source. But what if there's no evolutionary linkage whatsoever? And, you know, that would imply, not prove, but imply that life originated on two separate worlds independently. Well, as I said a few minutes ago, you know, there's hundreds of billions of planets and you know, moons and just huge numbers of worlds out there. So if we have independent origin of life on, on two different worlds, I think that's telling us that there's enormous numbers of life-bearing worlds in our galaxy. So I'm now gonna turn my attention to Europa and the icy moons of the outer solar system. 
Now Europa is the fourth largest moon. We see kind of a detailed picture on the left and it's arrowed on the right. You can see it compared in size with the other three Galilean moons of Jupiter along with Earth and the moon. So you can see it's a pretty sizable world. Um, you know, from the Voyager flybys in the late 70s and early 80s, you know, that they could get a measure of Europa's bulk density, gave indications there could be a liquid water under the surface, maybe a liquid water ocean, and it was crisscrossed by these cracks you can easily see in this picture, indicating that there's some kind of material seeping up from below the ground. Um, and also we know, in fact, there was a press release that came out today about the tidal heating of Jupiter's moons that, you know, Ju Europa is getting tidally heated in this gravitational tug of war with Jupiter and the other three Galilean moons. So, you know, Europa has the ingredients for life as we know it. Uh, so, you know, Galileo flew by uh, Europa multiple times, gave us really great images like the one we see here. Um, you know, it revealed these, uh, these things, and you can kind of see it here, ice rafts that look like they're floating on top of something, some kind of liquid medium below. Uh, Galileo also discovered that uh, Europa has an induced magnetic field. That suggests there's some kind of subsurface icy ocean. And also the spectrometer discovered organic materials on the surface. Um, and since then, I mean, this is really interesting, is using Hubble Space Telescope data and archival Galileo data, there's evidence that Europa is actually shooting watery plumes into space. So there's abundant evidence that Europa has a thick ocean of water beneath the icy surface. And the models I've seen is that the, this ocean probably contains more water than all of Earth's oceans combined. There's a lot of water there. It's in contact almost certainly with a rocky layer below. And as I mentioned, the moon's being tidally heated. Um, you know, so Europa has all the ingredients for life as we know it here on Earth. Liquid water, organic molecules, and flows of energy. So it's really not difficult to imagine that it could have things analogous to hydrothermal vents that we have on Earth, uh, on our sea floors, and the, you know these hydrothermal vents fuel these very rich and complex ecosystems in the complete absence of sunlight. So certainly the floor, the bottom of this ocean on Europa is not getting any light, but that in no way precludes the possibility of life. So NASA is planning a mission in the the early 1930 or 2030s called Europa Clipper. Uh, it's not going to orbit Europa, it'll be a Jupiter orbiter, but the current plan is, for, is that Europa Clipper will make 44 uh, close flybys of Jupiter or, or of Europa over several years. It'll image the surface at, at you know, high resolution, measure the thickness of the ice so we know where it might be thinnest, do spectral measurements of the surface, It'll also fly through these plumes and give us more detailed uh, information about the composition. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping, you know, this isn't a mission that's being funded right now, but I'm hoping that Europa Clipper will pave the way for a future lander uh, that could, you know, search the surface for signs of life, but more important, either kind of melt its way through or drill through the ice and deploy some kind of submersible to explore the ocean and look for signs of life. You know, this would be an incredibly exciting mission. Uh, it's probably a long way off, but I hope maybe it'll happen in my lifetime. Now, there could, there's at least a dozen other of these ice shell moons in the outer solar system that could host life, or that have been, you know, thought of as possible abodes. Uh, one of the best candidates is Enceladus, uh, but as of now, there aren't any definite planned missions, uh, so I'm just going to kind of skip them over for the rest of this talk. Just a quick hit of water. Um, so and that brings me to Saturn's moon Titan, its largest moon, which is the second largest moon in the solar system after Ganymede, 
And here you can see it compared in size to Earth and the moon. Um, and you can see from this Cassini image that Titan just, you know, looks very different from all the other moons in the solar system. It's the only moon in the solar system that's enshrouded in a thick atmosphere. And amazingly, that atmosphere actually has similarities to Earth's atmosphere. Both atmospheres are nitrogen dominated, although on Titan, the second most dominant chemical constituent is methane. And actually its surface pressure is more similar to Earth's surface pressure than any other world in the solar system as well. It's about 50% higher than the surface pressure we get here on Earth at sea level. Now, uh, you know, Cassini carried a European built lander called Huygens. And as it was descending through the atmosphere, its descent camera took this amazing picture of, of, of the surface of Titan. And once again, this is a little bit like the Mars pictures we saw earlier. These look like, you know, river valleys, except on Titan, the liquid is not water. It's far too cold for liquid water, but it could be uh, methane. And then uh, ta uh, Huygens, uh, this was a tremendous mission, landed and survived on the surface for a little over an hour or sent images back for a little over an hour, or not images, but data, and uh, took this really wonderful surface picture. Now the temperature is minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. And you know, I have to think that's probably too cold for life as we know it, because at those cold temperatures, chemical reactions just slow to a crawl. But, you know, Titan appears to have hydrothermal areas where the temperatures could be much more comfortable for some kind of life. There also appears to be a subsurface ocean that probably contains a lot of water, perhaps mixed with ammonia. And Cassini's radar image uh, returned spectacular data that revealed these lakes. Uh, these, la these are all very close to the North Pole. These lakes are very comparable in size to the Great Lakes here in the United States, except these lakes contain methane and ethane, which are organic molecules. Uh, you know, so despite the cold temperatures, you know, Titan is a potential abode for life, if not life, you know, maybe prebiotic chemistry. And I love this artwork from British astrophysicist and artist uh, Mark Garlick. On Titan, there's a methane cycle. Like on Earth, we have a water cycle, uh, you know, where water rains out of the atmosphere, forms lakes and oceans, evaporates into clouds and rains out. Same thing with methane on Titan. So if there is life on Titan, uh, Chris Impey at University of Arizona says it would be life 2.0. This would be life as we don't know it, as defined by Michael Summers and Jim Treffel. So NASA has a mission, is planning a mission. It's been, it's getting funding. And to me, this is an incredibly exciting mission scientifically and technologically. They want to fly this kind of robotic helicopter. They call it a rotor craft. Uh, the current schedule is a 2026 launch for a 2034 arrival. Now this is a very technologically challenging mission. Uh, but it'll, exp it'll be explore multiple sites on, on Titan and really uh, give us a much better understanding of this world. Not sure it will find any evidence for life, but at the very least, it should give us a very good understanding of, you know, kind of organic chemistry, maybe prebiotic chemistry on a world that has certain similarities to Earth. So the second road is uh, exoplanets. And I checked about an hour before I logged into the meeting. And according to exoplanet.eu, the current count of known exoplanets is 4,333. That is 541 times as many known planets outside the solar system than orbit the sun. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, our galaxy has hundreds of billions of planets. If you add in moons as possible habitats, we're talking you know, over a trillion worlds out there. Uh, but you know, none of them are close. The closest planet 
is 4.2 light years away. That's 25 trillion miles. So you might be wondering, how can we study them for signs of life? And especially this diagram on the left gives an explanation. And that is uh, you can probe exoplanet atmospheres right now. It's being done right now using transit spectroscopy. So most of the known planets that of these 4,333 were discovered with Kepler. So they're transiting planets. They periodically cross in front of their star. And as they cross in front of the star, some of the light from the star is passing through the upper atmosphere of the planet. So you can, astronomers can take, they're using Hubble and various ground-based telescopes to do this work. You can measure, you take a spectrum of the star when the planet is in transit and out of transit. And when the planet's in transit, you see some e extra spectral lines from this starlight passing through the upper atmosphere. So scientists have been doing this and have been, found, they, they, you know, one world, they found water vapor, you know, they found carbon dioxide, you know, a whole bunch of different elements and chemical compounds in the atmosphere of extrasolar planets. So as an example here, we have, uh, you know, the spectrums, spectra of Venus, Earth, and Mars. We have Venus on the top, Earth middle, Mars bottom. And when you look at Earth's spectrum, it, it immediately looks a lot more interesting than, than that of Venus and Mars. All three of them have, you know, absorption feature for carbon dioxide. But on Earth, you have a strong water signature and you have a very deep line for ozone, that's O3. Um, and of course, that's free oxygen. Now, oxygen is a highly reactive element. Uh, so it would not remain in Earth's atmosphere for, you know, very long stretches of time unless it's constantly being replenished. <clears throat> and on Earth, that's photosynthesis and other biogenic activity that's putting that, that oxygen in the atmosphere. You look at Venus and Mars, however, you basically see CO2 and not much else. So the CO2, there's a lot of different processes that have nothing to do with life that produce CO2. So, you know, an alien astronomer with an advanced telescope looking at Earth from afar would very be very interested in Earth and would, would conclude that Earth is, they'd have a different name for it, of course, but they would conclude that Earth probably has some form of life and might even have a very rich uh, biosphere. So this is what, how we can discover, you know, life on exoplanets, even though they're, you know, trillions of miles away. So as I mentioned, telescopes are doing this right now, but to really see biomarkers, we're probably going to need the next generation telescopes. But fortunately, uh, these are coming right up. The, the, one of the telescopes that's going to do this work is NASA's James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to well, the launch keeps getting pushed back, but right now it's scheduled for October 31st of next year. Uh, so it has a six and a half meter mirror. It's optimized for the infrared. So it's gonna be able to de detect things like water, ozone, methane, and CO2 and exoplanet atmospheres. And one of its prime targets is gonna be a really interesting planetary system called TRAPPIST-1 which has seven planets, all of which are pretty similar to Earth in size. Now, it's a little misleading. See where it says in large size 25 times. These planets, if they were orbiting the sun, would all be well inside Mercury's orbit. So they're packed in really, really close to the star, but the star is a red dwarf, a very low luminosity star. And it turns out that three of these planets actually orbit within the habitable zone of this very feeble red dwarf. So, you know, this is going to be a really interesting target for JWST uh, after it launches. But I think even more compelling, um, most of the people I interviewed for the article think this could be done better from the ground by these new giant ground-based telescopes that are being built. We have 30-meter telescope, 30-meter aperture on the left. 
the giant Magellan telescope lower left and the European extremely large telescope at the lower right. So these things have huge apertures. Uh, they're gonna be equipped with very, very sophisticated uh, spectrometers for, get, you know, they're gonna get very high spectral res resolution, much better than JWST. Uh, now, because they're on Earth's surface, they're gonna be doing, you know, kind of visible and near infrared observations. So they're gonna be looking for things like oxygen two, oxygen three, and water. So if life is common, um, there's a decent chance that one or more of these telescopes will start detecting bio signatures, perhaps even before the end of this decade or early in, early in the 2030s. But of course, astronomers are thinking of, you know, bigger and better. There's several teams working on this. Uh, the one that I talked about in the uh, astronomy article is there's an international consortium working on what's called Exo Life Finder or ELF. And it's going to use this kind of coronagraphic technique to be able to blot out the, life, uh, the light of the star, which, you know, depending on the wavelength and the star and the distance of the planet, the star is roughly a million times brighter than the planet. So you want to blot the light out so you can, cat, you can really study the feeble light of the planet. When you can do that, you're not just limited to transiting planets. You know, most planets don't transit the stars as seen from Earth. So ELF will be able to study vastly more planets than, you know, than you can see through, uh, through the transit method. And it could be able to give us really detailed spectra of planets orbiting other stars and, and really search for these biosignatures one of its really compelling targets will be the uh, planet that's been discovered, uh, the inner of two known planets now orbiting Proxima Centauri. Uh, this is uh, you know, the closest star to the sun. It's uh, 4.2 light years away, relatively close you know, in, on a galactic scale. Um, we know there's a planet there from radial velocity. It's not a transiting planet. We know very little about that planet. It's just slightly more massive than Earth. It orbits its star at about 1 20th, the Earth-Sun distance, or about 1 20th, 0.05 AU. This star is uh, like the Trappist-1. This is a feeble red dwarf star. So even though this planet is really close to the star, it's within Proxima Centauri's habitable zone. So this will be a really exciting target uh, for these giant ground-based telescopes. And last but not least, I want to mention Louvoir, uh, which large ultraviolet optical infrared surveyor. This is sort of, you know, it's not under construction. It's sort of very much and still a conceptual uh, uh, phase right now that astronomers are figuring out like how to build it and what its specifications should be. There's sort of two different designs right now. There's a 15 meter telescope design and an eight meter design, uh, but this will be a space-based telescope. Uh, you know, assuming it works and works according to spec, it'll give us detailed information about hundreds of exoplanets. Uh, you know, this will probably answer the question of how common life is in the galaxy but it's you know, far in the future right now. I think whether it gets built or not, it's not a question of science or engineering, it's a question of politics about whether it'll get built, when it will get built, and who will build it. So I wanna get to the final part of my talk now, which is kind of the, to me, the fun part. It's a bit speculative. I hope you'll forgive me on that. Uh, and this is uh, SETI and techno signatures. And I, you know, techno signatures is pretty much what you think it means. It's basically signs of an advanced civilization that could be like modifying its planet or its environment in ways that our advanced telescopes could detect. Now, since um, uh, since the 19 early 1960s, you know, astronomers have been using radio telescopes and arrays like here we see the Allen Telescope Array. Uh, to search for radio signals from advanced civilizations. Now, of course, this is only a tiny part of what radio astronomers actually do. 
And in fact, in recent years, a lot of these radio SETI projects have piggybacked on radio observations of, of star, you know, that are just regular radio observations of stars and black uh, galaxies, black holes, et cetera. Uh, the most advanced SETI project right now is called Breakthrough Listen. It's being very gen generally, gener generously funded by this Russian Israeli millionaire named Yuri Milner, you see at the upper left. And it's using these uh, two of these Green Bank Telescope, West Virginia, the Parks Observatory in Australia, and other radio telescopes as well. Uh, just a week ago, they released data on nearly 300,000 stars. Now, up to now, we don't have any confirmed alien radio signals, but you know, SETI has barely scratched the surface. That negative result doesn't really tell us, that, you know, the fact that we don't have a positive result doesn't really tell us anything because if you look at the, you know, how deep it's searched and the frequencies, it's only a tiny, tiny, you know, amount of the parameter space that you could search uh, using radio. Um, so, you know, these searches are ongoing. Um, you know, we've got better receivers now that can simultaneously listen to millions of radio channels simultaneously, you know, narrow band channels. So if there are large numbers of radio transmitting civilizations in our galaxy, and if there are, some of them are, you know, emitting powerful signals, you know, who knows, someday one of these projects might hit the jackpot. There's also several groups. Uh, I know Paul Horowitz there at CFA has done experiments looking for uh, laser, pulse laser signals from other civilizations. This is known as optical SETI. Uh, the group that seems to be the most advanced right now is based out of the University of California at San Diego, led by Shelley Wright. Uh, they've recently installed a, a near-infrared detector to do optical SETI on the one-meter telescope at Lick Observatory, and they're working on an even more advanced uh, instrument to install on one of these next-generation, you know, large ground-based telescopes. But I'm going to argue, uh, this is, you know, my prediction, uh, I'm going to argue that if we ever do discover other civilizations, I would put my money that it's not going to be through a SETI program, but it's going to be by the serendipitous discovery of techno signatures. So consider these objects on this slide. Um, all of them are objects or phenomenon that were discovered by pure serendipity. In other words, they were discovered by astronomers who weren't looking for these things. They were kind of discovered almost accidentally. Um, and what had happened is that the, you know, the instrumentation or the observing technique had kind of crossed a threshold where suddenly these objects could come into view. So my point is this, if there are advanced civilizations out there, some of them might be engaging in astro engineering projects that might become visible to our telescopes once we cross a certain technological threshold. So here's just an example. Uh, this is some uh, space art of a colony orbiting a black hole. So this techno signature is, you know, it's a fascinating but obviously very speculative enterprise because we really don't know. I mean, it's sort of forcing us to envision what civilizations far, far in advance of us might be doing. So, you know, they could be millions of years ahead of us. I was talking with Richard Nugent the other day and he was mentioning the Pilgrims. They landed at Plymouth in 1620. That was only 400 years ago. I mean, you know, we're holding this meeting over Zoom. I think Richard said like, if you tried to tell the Pilgrims what we would be doing 400 years later, they would burn us at the stake. You know, it would be crazy to them. So I don't think we really can say you know, what civilizations millions of years ahead of us might be doing. You know, obviously we're not about to build a space colony around a black hole, but I, who knows what, what they might be doing. Uh, so this again is a, uh, a slide of ELF, Extra Life Finder, which I showed a few minutes ago. Um, one of the things that Jeff Kuhn of University of Hawaii told me that this telescope could do 
is it when it does spectroscopy of exoplanets, it could detect stuff like chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs, artificially produced gases in the at atmospheres of exoplanets. So, you know, if there's civilizations out there that are polluting their atmospheres and they're within ELF's range, we could find their pollution. Uh, the other thing he told me, and this blew my mind, is it could, you know, it'll be looking at the night sides of these planets and it'll be doing thermal imaging. And he said, yeah, you know, a nearby planet with a civilization, we could detect the thermal emissions from cities on, on planets within a few dozen light years of Earth. I mean, that would be really an amazing discovery. Uh, who knows what those planets would look like? I saw a lot of uh, picture, you know, Google images. I like this, this uh, artwork the most. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of this concept uh, called a Dyson sphere. It really should more accurately be called a Dyson swarm. Uh, it's named after Freeman Dyson, the great British physicist who died just a few months ago at age 97. The idea actually dates even further back, but in the 1960s, he popularized this idea that a very advanced civilization could disassemble planets and asteroids and build swarms of space colonies surrounding the star that would harvest most of the light coming from the star. I mean, that's the star is a free source of energy. So you could, you know, collect enormous amounts of energy to fuel, you know, a very, very advanced civilization with enormous numbers of beings by building these Dyson spheres. Now they would show up in a telescope in the infrared. You'd have, because they give off these, you know, individual orbiting objects would be radiating waste heat in the infrared part of the spectrum. So astronomers have actually looked at stars in infrared data and even entire galaxies to see if they can find infrared signatures from Dyson spheres. So far, haven't found anything, but this is just an example of the kind of mega structures or astro engineering projects, you know, that could be out there and that we could potentially find. Um, and you know, there's a, a really a very creative astronomer at Penn State University named Jason Wright, not too far from where I live. Uh, he's pointed out, you know, we've barely even explored the solar system. And you know, we might not even have to look into deep space to find evidence of an extraterrestrial civilization. And a case in point is the movie and novel, 2001, A Space Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke. So he had this idea that there was a civilization that came through the solar system and buried this monolith not far below the surface of moon the moon, once humans start colonizing the moon, we discover it. Now we're not gonna find something like this, you know, through rovers or landers. This might require, you know, future human exploration. But Jason Wright's point is, you know, we barely really explored the solar system and there could be artifacts out there from other civilizations that have sent probes here or traveled through the solar system and maybe left something behind uh, you know, that we could find. And he even said, I mean, I don't believe this is happening, but he said it's possible that there could be active or derelict alien probes right now orbiting the sun. Uh, and how would we know? Uh, you know, you, we would have to do this thorough search of the vast expanses of the solar system of interplanetary space to, to find one of these things, you know, it might, it would be incredibly hard to detect, but you know, if you think other civilizations exist and you accept the idea that some of them, you know, maybe originated, let's say a billion or more years ago, they endured for millions of years, maybe are still around, we can't rule any of this out, that this is, this is a possibility. Um, there's even been, you know, serious scientists who put forth the idea that Earth could have hosted a civilization millions of years ago. And there was a paper that came out a couple years ago in astrobiology by Adam Frank and Gavin Schmidt that showed that if there was a civilization 
plate tectonics along with just regular wind and water erosion would almost completely erase all signs of that civilization. Uh, and it would be very difficult for us to detect that civilization. And just as a case in point, just like in the last five years, uh, archeologists have discovered these cities the, in, in, in Mexico and Central America of fairly sizable Mayan cities whose ruins are literally right there on the surface or right below the surface, but it required this new technique of airplane LIDAR, that's sort of the light equivalent of radar, to unveil veil these cities. So we were unaware of these cities that were inhabited less than a thousand years ago. And yet the, you know, we were unaware of these until just a few years ago. So, you know, who knows? I, I don't think we're gonna find uh, evidence of an advanced civilization that once lived on Earth. I'm basically just saying though that we cannot rule out the possibility. So I wanna just, you know, conclude by saying that I think it's obvious that a conclusive discovery of another civilization would be a really big deal. I mean, it would be a great discovery. Um, if the civilization is more advanced than us, it would be really nice to know, you know, know because it would give us more optimism that technological civilizations can kind of survive technological adolescence like I'm really concerned about the future of humanity. I mean, there's a lot of talk about climate change. I've done a lot of reading about nuclear war. I think that's actually a much bigger existential threat. And unless we do something to deal with our arsenals, it's probably just a matter of time. And I hope I don't live to see that. Um, but if we find other civilizations, they're likely to be far more advanced. That'll give us some hope that we can get make it through this period. It, let's say they turn out to be machine life. That could tell, be telling us that humans have a post-biological future. I know Ray Kurzweil's written about the singularity where eventually we merge with artificial intelligence. And maybe that's our long-term future is to merge with machines or machines eventually replace us. Um, but you know, I think without doubt, confirming the existence of another civilization would have you know really profound ramifications in ways we can't predict you know depending exactly what it is we learn and you know even if we don't detect a civilization but just detect plant and animal life or even microbial life that would still be fascinating it would you know give us insight into the origin of life the types of planets and environments that can support life and let's say with these next generation telescopes, we go decades and search hundreds of planets and we do the thorough exploration of the solar system and we come up empty. You know, that would, you know, I'd be kind of sad. Well, I won't be alive for that, but it would be kind of sad, but it would be interesting to know that maybe life is a relatively rare phenomenon. So, you know, that something unusual or very unlikely or rare happened on earth. That would be interesting to know that. So in my view, no matter what we find or don't find, you know, the search for life on other worlds uh, was gonna tell us a lot about ourselves and our place in this really wondrous universe. So thank you. Uh, here's some books I recommend uh, that I read recently and I'll be happy to take questions. I'm not sure how we're gonna do this, but uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Oh, that was awesome. Uh, I think people can just unmute themselves and ask away, you know, before, but before they do, um, I love thinking about, you know, um, microbial extraterrestrial life. I, I, I think the, my own personal feeling is that we're much more likely to find microbes than we are to find complex life. And um, I always think I about, um, I always think about, uh, go back to the Apollo landings where they quarantined the astronauts when they returned back from the earth. And think about a return sample from Mars, how careful one would have to be with such a sample for fear <laughs> that it would contain microbes that, I mean, look what we're going through with this novel coronavirus. All we need is something for extraterrestrial. We'd never be able to deal with that. Yeah, that that's, a, that's a great point, Richard. So <clears throat> another article that I wrote that hasn't been published yet it's for my alumni magazine. I wrote a profile that's going to run in the fall issue about Patricia Ann Stratt, 
who was one of the lead scientists on this Mars labeled release experiment that I talked about that, you know, and she very much thinks that they probably found life on Mars. Uh, so she's really kind of frustrated that we haven't followed up on that. But, you know, she, you know, she believes that her experiment found life on Mars. And, you know, she told me when I interviewed her uh, that she thinks it's like crazy that we're returning samples from Mars without knowing what those samples contain. You know, she, she's of the view we should do these experiments on Mars and only when we know for absolute certainty that this is safe thing to do, should we bring samples back uh, to Earth? Now, a counter argument to, <coughs> to that is Jim Green, who's the lead s chief scientist for NASA, and you know his view is that if there's life on Mars right now, that it's undergone a different evolution, even if it's somehow related to Earth life, it's it's gone through a separate evolution, which virtually, which essentially in his mind guarantees it won't be dangerous or hazardous. And then he also said that I think he called them Class Four laboratories, and you know he says this is going to be so. You know, these laboratories are so safe that there's no way anything dangerous could get out. So I don't know, you know, I kind of see both points of view. I'm not sure where I come down on this, um, but I think you raise a very good question. And it's definitely a question that's been, you know, discussed and contemplated by the scientific community. Well, you know, and I think the door goes both ways. Um, didn't they deorbit? the Galileo space probe and the Cassini space probe into the atmospheres of, of uh, Jupiter and Saturn respectively to mm, prevent contamination um, by the probe on some a place like Europa or right. Enceladus. That's great. Um, you, you want your spacecraft to be clean um, yeah. when they go to these places. And, and Dr. Strat, I mean, one of the things she told me is she doesn't think that the landers and rovers that have been sent to Mars since Viking have been sterilized nearly to the level that they should have been. So she's concerned um, about that. And I've definitely talked to scientists who, you know, are worried about this contamination. And, you know, they've said to me, we don't want to send spacecraft looking for life on Mars and we find life on Earth because we've contaminated Mars and and some some have even said we should not even think about sending humans to Mars until we can really rule out that there's life on Mars because if we send if we haven't answered the question if there's life on Mars and we send people you know the humans are going to bring all sorts of microbes with us and maybe just whatever Martian life might be there just gets like drowned out by earth life. And so we can never answer the question. So you're raising really, really important questions that, you know, I think this, you know, these future plans for exploring Mars, especially with humans need to take these questions very, very seriously. I'm, I don't know if I have an informed enough opinion or thought to really give you an informed opinion, but these are very, very important questions that need, are, that I know we're being discussed at a very serious level. Thanks, Bob. Um, there must be other questions. Yes, may I? Of course. Uh-oh, is Mario gonna heckle me? No, I'll be kind to you. <laughs> I actually miss having dinner with you in our long discussions. Uh, I do too. Anyways. Um, so one of the, uh, I was involved with transit projects and uh, one of the reasons we were looking at these was to find planets that can eventually be looked at to find oxygen, free oxygen. So my question is, would the presence of free uh, um, molecular oxygen by spectroscopy be sufficient proof that there's life on one of these planets? That, that's a great question, Mario. And that I was going to mention this, and I forgot to mention it. So oxygen alone would, would be very strongly suggestive, but it would really not in all likelihood be considered proof for that. And it might, you might never have 100% proof, but what would even be more compelling than free oxygen 
is finding what's known as disequilibrium chemistry. And that would be a, a combination of chemicals, of reactive chemicals that coexist in the atmosphere of a planet that would really, you would not expect to exist together. So for example, on Earth, you know, if the, if the aliens had really good spectroscopy of Earth, they would also detect methane and the combination of like oxygen and methane along with the water vapor, you know, because water is, you know, a great solvent for life. You know, if we found something like that would be, you know, the Occam's razor would say yes, and almost certain that there's life on that planet, especially if you found several planets with similar signatures. But these astrobiologists have actually been very creative and come up with other types of biosignatures or combinations of this disequilibrium chemistry that they could find that would be very strongly indicative of life. There's also, you know, the idea of looking for what's called the red edge, which would be the spectrum that you could see of vegetation. So there's a whole bunch of different things that you could see that would maybe give you maybe not 100% confidence that there's life on the planet, but very high. Um, hi, can I, can I say something? Sure. Yeah. Okay, um, I was actually at a uh, meeting of people looking at the techno signatures last year. And one thing that we came up with is a, is that if one of the most likely things is in our solar system, as you were pointing out, if you, since we never actually surveyed the surface of the moon to say on the order of scale of a half meter or something, okay, what, imagine the fact that if you were uh, a, a civilization that was far away and was interested in just looking around, you know, producing, producing probes that it would, that would hopefully land for, and last for a very long time, you would probably want to dump them on the moon because the moon is, has no tectonics and no atmosphere, so things would last for a long time. And you would imagine that they would be things like little celestial scale telescopes sitting there on the moon in various places. Yep. And you would be able to, you, you know, we, yet, we, yes, we couldn't see them with the current, the current uh, uh, surveys we've looked at. So if you looked at every, every little square meter of the moon, you might find something that was left around by somebody maybe a million years ago, which was interested in, in just examining our solar system. Now, that, that's, that's a great point. And, and that reminds me that the, the movie and novel 2001 were originally based on a short story that Arthur C. Clarke wrote called The Sentinel. And if I remember it correctly, I mean, I read this many years ago, it was a small artifact that was found on the moon. And that was later kind of developed into the monolith. Uh, but that was something that, you know, that human explorers found on the moon. And there could be stuff like that, you know, not just the moon, but you know, Mars or some of the asteroids or the moons of Mars, and we would not know. Um, you know, I, I was kind of, when I first started talking with Jason Wright about this stuff, I was kind of very skeptical about this stuff. And then, you know, he, he basically said, I mean, we've barely even begun to explore the solar system. You know, we've done some survey work, you know, we've had some landers on some of these worlds, but you know, we have not done the detailed exploration that can rule stuff like this out that you were just mentioning. Uh, I have a question about, um, uh, you did mention this interstellar objects that, uh, that uh, apparently there are already two uh, that uh, 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 pass, uh, pass through the solar system. Yeah. Uh, so, so these objects could, some of them like extending the artifacts of uh, things that uh, Jason Wright mentioned, uh, they, there may be something on this interstellar objects that might provide clue to where they came from. And so uh, I, I heard there's already a plan to try to, well, for the next one, if we discover such thing, they, they could really grab on this opportunity to uh, to launch spacecraft to look closely you, instead of letting just like this two, letting 
let them let them pass through the solar system without doing much. Okay, that yeah, and that's an interesting idea. Now, I was talking about Arthur C. Clarke just a few minutes ago. He came up with, and I read this many years ago as well, a brilliant science fiction novel called Rendezvous with Rama, in which this you know kind of tubular shaped interstellar spacecraft comes into the solar system. We're able to send astronauts there, go inside and explore it. Um, having said that, and, and I don't want to dismiss this possibility, when I was an editor at Astronomy Magazine, this was from 1995 to 2000, I had Alan Stern write a feature article. I can't remember which issue it was in. I think it was in like in late 96 or early 97 issue in which he wrote an article about interstellar objects. These would be, you know, kind of asteroids and comets from other planetary systems that are flung out, just like the solar system, Jupiter and uh, Saturn, flung out trillions of these small objects and just hurled them out into the galaxy. So he, in this article, predicted that sooner or later we're going to find these objects. And he predicted like what their speed is going to be. They're most likely going to come from a certain direction, uh, et cetera. Um, and they're getting, you know, the trajectory, et cetera. He made all sorts of predictions in this article. Well, lo and behold, the first two objects, especially the first one, Oumuamua, was almost exactly what he predicted for a completely natural interstellar object. You know, he, he wrote this article, you know, 25 years ago. Um, so my get, I mean, I, I would put, I would pr almost bet my life to win $1 that both of the objects we've seen so far are purely natural objects. Um, and that we're gonna see a lot more of these things in the coming years especially with these big survey telescopes being built. Um, having said that, we should absolutely, you know, get deep, try to get as detailed information of these objects as we can, you know, because we're going to learn a lot about the population of asteroids and comets around other stars. And certainly if we find something with very unusual properties or spectral signature, you know, then who knows? Yeah, so we definitely should look but I sh I, it's important to note that these interstellar objects have been predicted for many years. And the first two that we've seen have properties that are very much along the lines of what astronomers expected for natural objects. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Anyone else? Yeah, I do. Sure, Marion. Um, what about um, evidence for interdependence of life? If we're looking at just um, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and methane, and a few others, is there anything that could, I mean, there, there are other, other life on Earth. Is there other life on Earth that doesn't need oxygen? We are talking about the, the lower depths of the ocean. Or oh, the yeah. And the ice caps. So yeah. uh, is there any way we could look at an interdependence in life? I mean, look at the earth and how much life and different forms there are here. Is there any way of doing that on, on, on spacecraft or, or however we, we tend to uh, are looking? No, that's, that's a great question. And for example, in all three of these books that are on my screen, on the screen right now, all of them, you know, all three really discuss life forms that could be quite a bit different from life on Earth. Um, but when you look at Earth, what's amazing is, and I kind of mentioned this very briefly, I mean, the variety of life on Earth is just staggering. Uh, you know, the different kinds of environments from super hot to super cold, you know, life that can survive in like acid that's like as acidic as battery acid or, you know, bases, or, you know, or, you know, alkaline. Um, you know, it's really incredible the range 
that life is adapted to on Earth. But what's really interesting is that, is that all of life on Earth, kind of at its very basic building blocks, you know, the proteins and amino acids, the genetic material, is all kind of the same kind of stuff. It's all, you know, cellular and based on liquid water as a solvent and using DNA and RNA. So it's all kind of at the very basic level is all kind of the same thing, but life has evolved to fill this incredible variety of niches. And I think that's why we really, it would be unbelievable to find life on another world. As I mentioned, if it's, you know, if it's, let's say, um, Mars, to find out if there's any relationship to life on Earth or not. If not, I mean, that would be like, wow, that would be incredible. And like, to me, I would love to find life and, and have scientists be able to study life on one of these moons in the outer solar system. For example, if there's life in the ocean of Europa or Enceladus or Titan, that life almost certainly has no genetic or evolutionary relationship to life on Earth because it's, uh, that's life from like underneath the solid mm -hmm. crust. So it's not like with Mars where the two planets are exchanging rocks and materials and meteorites. Um, so to me, that would be really profound because that if the life probably has no relationship at all to life on Earth, but let's say it still uses carbon and liquid water, you know, that might be indications that all life in the galaxy, at least maybe not, you know, it doesn't have an evolutionary relationship to Earth, but at least is made of some of the same building blocks. Or, you know, especially with Titan, it could be really different. Um, and certainly when we do exoplanet spectroscopy, as I mentioned a few minutes ago in the Q&A, I know that, you know, the astronomers who are doing these biosignature research are really trying to be broad-minded and might really see spectral signatures of life that could be quite a bit different from Earth life that's adapted to a planet with very different conditions than Earth. And, and by the way, in my um, web article, there's a really interesting idea that we think of Earth as being like this wonderful planet for life. Well, there's some astrobiologists who think that super Earths in the habitable zones of K stars are actually even more habitable than Earth. And they point out that there's large areas of Earth that have no life, like the deserts have, some of our deserts have almost no life. Areas of the oceans with low oxygen, well, these super Earths would have much larger surface area. They would keep plate tectonics going and volcanism going. If they're orbiting a K star, um, they, they, you know, the K stars have much longer lifespans than the sun, which is a G star. So you can make a compelling argument that Earth is not even like the best type of planet for life. There could be yeah. planets out there that they call super habitable. I'm, I'm not saying that's true or not, but I think it's an interesting idea. Hi, can I ask a question? This is Christian. Sure, Christian. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, this was just wonderful and fantastic. Thank you. Um, I have a question about water. I mean, this is um, the life uh, that we know of uh, uses water as a solvent, as you said. Um, do we know how much the mass of water is in our solar system? It seems uh, much greater than I actually initially thought when I was younger, when we add up all of these water worlds. And um, with that, where does water actually come from and is it abundant? Um, is it, was it created in the solar system or is it uh, kind of part of the, the, the gas that made the solar system? Yeah, uh, uh, great uh, questions. Yeah. It could be uh, elsewhere. Yeah, so great questions, uh, getting really good questions, so I appreciate it very much. Uh, here's the good news. Water, of course, is made up of hydrogen, the most common uh, element in the universe and oxygen. I don't remember where it ranks, but oxygen is also very common. So water is a very, very common uh, you know, molecule, not just in the solar system, but in the whole galaxy and universe. There's a lot of water out there. 
Uh, there's a, probably a huge amount of water in the solar system, uh, way more than we find here on oceans on Earth. Now, I, I do want to mention I dedicated the talk to Tal, Mental, but there was a scientist who I interviewed for my astronomy cover story uh, named Adam Showman at the uh, University of Arizona. And very tragically, he died. You know, I, I had interviewed him and he died just a few days later. And I had no idea. I don't know if he was sick when I interviewed him, uh, but it was, you know, I dedicated the article to him. Uh, but he did calculations that, you know, I think he thinks there's something like 12 to 15 worlds in the solar system that could have substantial liquid water oceans. That even includes Pluto. Um, so there is an enormous amount of water, liquid water in the solar system. I mean, we don't know exactly how much, but a lot more than just what we see in the oceans on Earth. Um, and the water would have been, you know, primordial. I mean, it would have been in the solar nebula. Uh, pri I, I, there was a paper that just came out recently, and I don't remember what its conclusion was, but, you know, the water, probably most of the water on Earth came from, um, you know, asteroids and comets. I can't remember what the fraction is, but, you know, these, wa these bodies colliding with Earth in the early solar system, you know, we're delivering large amounts of water to Earth. Uh, and one thing, you know, that should, we should consider is you could argue, if you're a pessimist about lot extraterrestrial life, I've heard this argument made that you could argue that Earth has kind of got lucky where we got enough water that, you know, we've got these nice oceans for, you know, origin and evolution of life, but we also have dry land. Like there could be planets out there that their entire surface is covered with water, maybe many miles deep. And on those planets, you could imagine that they could have life, but unlikely they would ever develop like a technological civilization on a water world, although who knows. Um, so so I, I have heard that argument that Earth kind of was endowed with kind of like a Goldilocks amount of water. We got enough to be great for life and evolution, but not too much to turn us into a water world. Thank you, Bob. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I, that, that was uh, just terrific. Um, yeah, I was uh, curious about, you know, the origin of uh, water. Where is it? Where is it prim primordial in the, in the nebula? Um, yes, yes, very much so. And, and, the good news, water is everywhere. Water is one of the most common uh, compounds. And, and, and certainly when, when astrobiologists think about extraterrestrial life, you know, they, they, you know f the good news is carbon is common and water is common. And it's probably not an accident, you know, that we're made of carbon and use water. Now there's other chemical properties of water and uh, carbon that make them really ideal for life. But the good news is, is that these are very, very common. So there's no doubt, I think even Carl Sagan used to say like, the stuff of life is everywhere. And that's, that's very good news for, you know, the, the optimists in extraterrestrial life. That's very good news. If we were made out of, you know, some bizarre like barium and, you know, some incredibly rare chemical compound that would be give us a lot more reason to be pessimistic about life. But the things we're made out of is very, very widespread throughout the galaxy. Bob, I used to um, ask my students, uh, my chemistry students, if they ever considered where all of these atoms around us had come from. And I would always mention the idea of nuclear synthesis and stars. Yep. That's right. And, and that's why we see so much oxygen in the universe because it's being generated in stars, generations of stars that have gone before us. Yep. But um, most of the atoms that you see in the room around you were once inside of stars and, and the heavier stuff comes from more exotic places. But um, yeah, nucleosynthesis, read about that. That's pretty good stuff. And, and Richard, that brings up a really interesting question so when I was interviewing some of these scientists and, you know, and I've asked this question before is, 
think, you know, just think for a moment about technological civilizations. Like they didn't exist like in the first billion years in the Milky Way's history because the, the you know, the galaxy hadn't built up an inventory of the heavy elements with which you could, you know, build creatures that could develop technology and the kind of metals and other materials with which they could build a civilization. So the question I would ask is how long ago, like, is it possible that you would have the planets and, you know, with the metallicity that you could have a technological civilization? And, you know, no one can real, no one really knows the answer to that question but I generally get the view that, you know, the first civilizations could have developed, you know, number of billion years ago, like maybe like five, three, five billion years into the galaxy's history, there was enough heavy elements, you know, that you can form planets capable of, you know, like Earth or super Earth, and that could then produce, tech, you know, civilizations. So, you know, it's possible that you know, if you believe that civ there are civilizations out there, the first ones might have emerged billions of years ago. We just don't know. And one thing I really avoided in my talk was speculating about how many are out there. Now, I, my view is that we just don't know. I mean, it could be very low number or it could be a very high number. I just think we don't know. It's really, you know, people have done all this speculation about it and theorizing you know, calculating numbers and plugging them into the Drake equation. My view is we just don't know. And all of this is an observational question. We just have to go out and look and see what's out there. Uh, I have another question that just related to this. Uh, if, if there are civilizations that developed long before us, there is some idea, interesting idea about the space uh, archaeology. Have you heard of this? Yeah, like, uh, they uh, just go out to look for this relics of the civilizations. So I'm not sure how to begin to do this. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, that that would be. I mean, it's certainly this would be hard to do from Earth. It's finding like like for example, we could find life-bearing planets through the bio signatures. You know, through uh, you know these next-generation telescopes, and say, okay, well, there's probably life on that planet but we might not have any indication of intelligent life, that does not preclude the possibility that you know, millions of years ago, that planet may have had intelligent life. Uh, and certainly, let's say a civilization observing Earth, let's say even just a thousand years ago, wouldn't have seen any signs of intelligent life on Earth. Or let's say we destroy ourselves one way or another, you know, someone looking at Earth you know, a few thousand years in the future would have no way of knowing. So I think for that, and I, you know, I've read about this interstellar archaeology, that really might require interstellar travel. And, you know, and when you read about SETI and advanced civilizations, interstellar travel becomes a really big issue because, um, you know, if you, you have what's called the Fermi paradox that, if there's a lot of civilizations out there, they endure for millions or hundreds of millions of years, you can ask the question, why don't we see any signs of them? They should be venturing all over the galaxy. Um, you know, but as I said, they could be here and we wouldn't even know it. So I don't think that's a really strong constraint. But you know, I would argue that you know, I, I've read people, you know, very serious thinkers who just completely rule out the idea of interstellar travel and you know i think at our current state we we can't rule that out especially maybe we don't travel to the stars but maybe we develop artificial intelligence and do machines and send machines out into the stars and maybe the machines can go and replicate themselves and you know i i just think we don't really know what's out there um but you know some of these questions are not going to be resolved in my lifetime unfortunately but yeah, if we can someday, our descendants can start exploring other planets up close, um, who knows what they're going to find. Well, there is, a, speaking of that, there is a, already a, a project, the Breakthrough Starshot. Yes. That, yep. um, that they are sending these uh, small satellites, uh, well, 
small uh, small satellite, like uh, very tiny tiny satellites uh, to uh, Proxima Centauri. Uh, I'm right. not sure. Yeah, that's the goal in 20 years. Yeah. yeah. So, it would take, yeah, I think, yeah, I think they're going at what is it like 10 or 20% the speed of light. So yes. yeah, or 5%. So yeah, it would like take 20, 30 years to get there. I mean, I think that's still a long way in the future, but I mean, just, I'm glad you brought that up because think about it. You know, we've only been flying airplanes in our atmosphere for a little under a hundred or a little over a hundred years, you know, since the Wright brothers in 1903. And already we're, we're thinking about, you know, practical ways we could send, you know, spacecraft to, uh, you know, to the nearest star, and, you know, and you could argue we're a fairly primitive civilization. And yet, you know, we're, there's already a lot of intelligent thought that's been put into how to do that. So, you know, once you start thinking that civilizations don't destroy themselves and go on and exist for very long stretches of time, they're going to be capable of doing things that, you know, we can barely even imagine right now. I'm not saying that, that it does happen or it has happened. I'm just saying we can't rule that possibility out. But even, even if it's very, very difficult to transmit something fairly large, like a person, very great distances, microelectronics, yeah. which is cheap. Okay. You could basically make, make robots that were the size of sand grains, basically that could, re could re report back what they find, that would be a very, that will be a, a scientific possibility fairly soon. And you could imagine sending just large clouds of exploratory creatures in all directions just to find out things for us. Because I don't yeah. think it's possible, you know, the, co the fundamental cost of sending something a great, uh, to outside the solar system is enormous. The, the uh, you're, fighting, you're fighting gravity and you're fighting also lots of other things like, you, if you're going fast enough, you're, you're getting clobbered by the cosmic rays that you're basically yep. creating <laughs> by being fast enough against the, against the uh, uh, interstellar medium. Yeah, and, and I think it, that this, uh, this breakthrough project, if, if, uh, if I'm not correct, that involves like these nano craft, you know, tiny little spacecraft accelerated, you know, by lasers and, uh, but yeah, the craft themselves are tiny and you send a whole bunch of them knowing that a lot of them aren't going to survive. But if just some of them make it, you know, to Proxima Centauri, you know, we could get some really good data. We know there's at least two planets there. There could be more. And as I said, one of them's in the, in the, in the habitable zone. Now, when I gave this talk a couple of weeks ago to the club in Michigan, a club in Michigan, imagine that some of these, these next generation space telescopes start detecting bio signatures and let's say they're on some planets within you know relatively close you know maybe a dozen or a couple dozen light years from earth i think that would stimulate real stimulate thinking and excitement about doing some kind of interstellar mission if we find out that there's something really exciting you know, not a hundred light years away, but maybe 10 or 20 light years away. That'll be really, re I think that'll stimulate and maybe put a lot of this thinking kind of on fast forward. Awesome. Hey, Bob, can I hold the questions for one second? Yeah. Um, it's getting a little bit late, everyone. And I, I yeah. think I'd like to just officially close the meeting out. Bob, can you yeah. stick around for a little while for questions and answers to continue? Uh, sure. Um, yeah. If I can, um, if I can take the, um, if I can take the slide set back, I just want to put my final slide up here. And if you don't mind, I'm going to go get a beer if that's okay. Sure. I'll be right back. All right. I have to go upstairs. And you well, break one for the rest of us. <laughs> well, I think it, it's getting a little. I, I didn't realize how late it was until I just took a look at my phone. Um, so let me cl let me close the official part of the meeting out. Um, uh, but before I go, I just want to make sure you guys are all aware, you folks are all aware that the next board meeting is going to be two weeks from tonight um, at eight o'clock. And I'll send out an invitation for that um, to the membership um, earlier that week. Um, if you're not on the board, we'll just let you kind of sit in and listen in to what we have to discuss. Um, but you're welcome to attend. The next monthly meeting is Thursday, October 8th at eight o'clock p.m. And I hope everybody um, 
uh, we had a good crowd tonight. I hope everybody had fun. I hope you guys will enjoy, uh, enjoy the next meeting in October.